everybody doing? Wow. Okay. Hey, we need to like stand up and do some stretches or anything. Like, come on, everybody get awake. How's everybody doing? Everybody good? Good. Okay. We need to start serving coffee. Let's make a note of that. Um, hey, my name is Mike, and I'm the lead pastor here. And you're going to see uh, some other teachers here on stage uh, starting actually in November. We're going to start a kind of introduce a teaching team to you because COVID changed everything about church. And I know that you don't immerse yourself in church culture, um, but I do. And so I just want to kind of keep you guys in the loop on what we mean by that. So pre-COVID, you know, we're used to packed services and some services we bring out extra chairs and, and it's exciting and it's amazing because you get to see a bunch of new people. And then something changed during the middle of that and we were forced inside for five or six months to where we had to contemplate and consider what was important to us. And on the other side of this, what we have seen is a lot of people that had a routine of something, they have removed a lot of things from the routine, and church is one of those things. And, and honestly, for us, like, it is sad to see a bit of an era of the way church was done kind of go away, but it's really exciting for us too because what we've seen emerge on the other side of this, um, our people are so much more hungry for the real truth of the gospel, the hope that lies in Jesus, and we think we have an opportunity unlike we've ever seen in history, and you guys get to be a part of that. And part of what we're doing is to shape that is training you intentionally to live your life outside of this building where you actually feel equipped to do so. And that's one of the things that the church, ours included, has done a poor job of over the course of, of history, honestly, in my opinion, uh, in the American church. But it's what God is calling us to do, and it is what we're moving toward. Towards It starts today with this series. If you saw these questions, made for more. Because we think everybody is made for more than what they're doing. Now, that doesn't mean there is a goal that we will never achieve here on earth. What that means is most people just don't know what they're supposed to do with their life. And most people live their lives settled at some level. And they seem frustrated their entire life. A lot of us do the jobs we do just because it makes the money that we need to pay our bills. Not because we're passionate about it or we love it. We marry the person that kind of was in front of us and honestly would settle for being with us a lot of times. I'm just kidding. That was a horrible example. <laughs> Some of you are like, it's true. Uh, she settled for me for sure. Um, <laughs> so the thing that I want you to understand is that a lot of times we do, we just settle. We never like push for the more that we're made for. So if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you're sitting in this room. Here's what I want you to kind of work through today. I want you to start to think about like, is your life literally everything that it should be? Like, do, do you think that there might be more? And you may have an incredible life. I mean, you may have all the money you want in the bank. You may have the job you love and you want. You may have married the person of your dreams. You may have, but you're single because that's what you wanted to do with your life. You may have the kids, your dreams, whatever. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, what I would challenge you to, to realize is that there is still something missing. Because I lived on both sides of this. Everybody who's a follower of Jesus has lived on both sides of this. And I had everything that I wanted at that point in my life when I surrendered to Jesus. And what I want you to work through is like, is there maybe more for your life too? Like, have you considered this? And I want you to think about, I want to put Jesus' name in the hat here that I want you to consider today. Because a lot of times we don't look towards him as that solution for the things that we're searching for. But if you're a follower of Jesus sitting in this room, here's what I want you to contemplate today. Are you truly, honestly living up to the potential that Jesus has in your life? And you know what? That does not equate to effort. The shift today we're moving from is from more effort to more Jesus. And this is a monumental paradigm shift that we're going to work through today. So one of the things we're shifting in our service starting next week is we're giving you an intentional time to just stop and just sit with the Lord for five intentional minutes each week where we're going to direct you on the screen for some things to do, but there's going to be some quiet music playing, but it's going to be our time for confession and repentance and communion. The band is going to be up here taking communion together. You guys will be down here taking communion together. And if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're like, man, that's going to be kind of weird. Well, here's what we'll ask you to do. We'll just ask you to sit and just think about your life. Like, how was this last week? How's this last month been? Man, 
what happened during COVID? Like, I feel like a lot of things changed for me. We're just going to ask you to just contemplate and consider some things, okay? And so we think that everybody can benefit from this. We're going to start that next week. But today we're going to get a little taste of it right in the middle of it. But I want to go to the Lord in prayer, ask him to bless the service today. So would you guys join me in prayer? God, we love you and we thank you for everything that you're doing here at City Life and in gospel preaching churches around this city, state, country, and globe today. God, we pray that you would just take this message today. Let us realize that the harder we try does not equate to honestly really anything to you unless we're trying harder to surrender more things to you. I pray today, God, that we would see where we stand with these things as we look to answer some of these questions. You got to pray for a blessing on this service. I pray that our hearts would be open to you, that we'd be honest and we would move forward from here with a very clear distinction of what we need to do next. We love you and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. So if you want to take your Bibles, we will be in Ephesians here in just a few minutes, but we're going to work through some things today kind of as a setup. And one of the things I want you to think through today is the paradigm of your life, okay? Let me give you the description of the word paradigm. A paradigm is what you think before you think about it, okay? Think about that. (laughs) A paradigm is what you think before you actually think about it. This means it is the instinctiveness of your life. It's the reason you do what you do subconsciously before you ever have to think about doing it. That is a paradigm. That means it is exactly who you are. It's ingrained in you from some point in time, and that is how you're living your life. So my question is, who told you and taught you how to live the way that you live? Who taught you how to act towards things? Who taught you how to react towards things? Who, who told you how to have conversations with people? Who, who taught you how to act in a boss-employee relationship? Who taught you how to study in school? Who taught you how to pick a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a future spouse? Who taught you how to raise children? Where did you get all of this from? Who taught you how to live your Christian life? Because somebody shaped a paradigm in your life, and Jesus wants to reshape that when we surrender our lives to him. So a paradigm is what you think before you even think it. It's instinctively who you are. So what we want to challenge today is your paradigm. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you may actually have a really good paradigm set in your life. You're healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally. You have an idea of spirituality. Maybe you think there's something higher out there than you. But... There's something that is missing because you instinctively do things without thinking about them that don't have anything to do with Jesus. For those of you that are followers, who shaped the way you live your life as a follower of Jesus? I started to think about this for me. Today is difficult for me because we're talking about moving from more effort to more Jesus. I was raised in a church that signified effort as spirituality. Just do this, just do this, just do this, just do this. Now, I honestly don't think it was intentional on their part. I think it's just the way they understood getting closer to Jesus. Make sure you're always reading your Bible. Make sure you're praying. Make sure you're not doing this list of 17,000 things. That's how I was raised. Do this, don't do this. So this shaped the paradigm of my life early on for effort. Now, in life, you hear, hey, you want a better job, work harder and get one. You want to make more money, work harder and longer to get one. You want to get a better degree, you have to put in more effort and go further and faster and longer. And so effort is at the center of our lives, except when it comes to following Jesus. We actually have to shift away from more effort to more surrender to get more Jesus. Because the thing I want you to understand is, depending on how you came to know Jesus, some of you were brought up as children in the church. Your paradigm was shaped for you without you knowing it. I just watched what people did. People read their Bible, so I read my Bible. People prayed, I prayed. We went every Sunday, so I went every Sunday. Besides that, my parents made me. I didn't have a choice. (laughs) But the things that I did, that paradigm was shaped for me early on. Now, for some of you, you've become followers of Jesus as teenagers and adults. Both of these are equally difficult because as a teenager or an adult, you have had already created the paradigm of your life. You were living your life exactly how you wanted to. You realized you couldn't save yourself, so you surrendered yourself to Jesus. He then said, now take that way of living and match it over to the way I want you to live. And he asked you to rewrite a new paradigm of your life, a whole new set of ways to do things, a whole new thought process. For those of you that were children, 
raised in the church like me, I had to unlearn a lot of things, and it's all around the one central theme of the gospel. Here's what it is in its entirety, if you're going to get this today. The gospel is quite simply this. We are all sinners in need of a Savior, so we are all on the same level playing field. A few thousand years ago in history, God said, hey, these people have sinned and are in need of rescue. Jesus, I want you to go be the rescue. Jesus agrees. He comes to earth in the flesh as God, duly here to exist for a few reasons. One, we were in a sacrificial system of animals where we had no direct access to God, and God said, I'm going to go be the final sacrifice so people can have direct access to us as God. He then lived a perfect, sinless life in the flesh so we would, he would understand rejection and humiliation and shame and temptation and all of these things that we experience as human beings. And he did it perfectly so he could say, look, here's the example. I want to show you that I did all this so you don't have to. You don't have to continually put in all of this effort to achieve this. I am achieving it for you. He then is wrongly accused and he gets nailed to a cross and it would have been about this height and his arms would have been out with big spikes through his wrist. His feet would have been over each other like this with one spike driven down through it and he would have been hanging here for people to be able to walk by and hurl insults and spit on him, punch him. He was a criminal. Society did not care about him and so you could literally do whatever you wanted to the people on the cross. It was the lowest, most humiliating and torturous way to die. And this is the death that Jesus actually endured. Now, imagine all of the followers who heard him say he was here to be the savior, this resurrected king, and they watched him get put into a grave. But then three days later, Jesus comes back to life. He cheats sin and he cheats death and he resurrects and he proves he's the savior of the world. And he is seen by over 500 people who have written eyewitness accounts that you can find in history books. And this is the essence of the gospel. Now, what does this have to do with you and me? Well, what it has to do with us is there was a point in time in your life, if you surrendered your life where you believed that was worth surrendering to, that you could not save yourself. And this Jesus is your savior. And so the paradigm of your thinking in your heart shifted to surrender everything to that. Now, when you move past that, you have to then constantly take your paradigm and lay it over onto Jesus and take it constantly and lay it over onto him and shift your way of doing things. And the only reason that we get off is because we forget the most central piece of our existence with Jesus, and that is the simplicity of the gospel. Here's what I mean by that. I want you to listen to these questions and work through these. Let's see how we're doing with these. If you're in more effort, you believe Jesus plus something is what you need. Because in order to have more surrender with more Jesus, you believe there's nothing that can be added to him. This next one is, you truly believe we're forgiven in salvation. You don't beat yourself up over and over about your sin. Now, that's if you're living for more Jesus. Do you honestly believe that? Because the gospel says that's true about your life. Do you believe that God did not give you a spirit of fear? Do you honestly believe that? Or has fear driven your life over the past five or six months due to the pandemic and the financial and the racial tension and all of that? Where have you landed here? Because God said, hey, I didn't give you that kind of spirit. The next one is, I can give all control of my life over to God and I can trust him with it. Do you believe that? Are you allowing God to call the shots in your life or are you calling the shots in your life? See, here's where you start to see the distinction of more effort and more Jesus, a few more. I believe God knows what I need better than I do and I trust him with everything. Would you say that that's true about your life or not? The last one is, He said to go and make disciples where you live, work, and play. Really easy to spot this one. Are you actually doing that or are you not? Because see, the Bible is very, very clear. When we surrender our lives in salvation and we put the gospel as the centerpiece of our life, we no longer have to use effort to get here. We put effort down. The only effort that we do is surrendering more things to this gospel of our life and rewriting the paradigm and the shift to where we move from more efforts to more Jesus. 
these things then become true about our lives. The Bible is very clear that these are the things I used to do. And now I don't do those anymore. These are the things that I do. And it is because I know Jesus plus nothing is what I need. I know I'm forgiven in salvation. I don't have a spirit of fear. I'm going to give control of my life over to God and trust him with it. God does know what I need more than I do. And I trust him. And I am going and making disciples where I live, work, and play. And those are the markers of my life in a new paradigm. And this is where we have to get to, church. Now, if you've seen any of these that you have said, that's not who I am. Okay, the good thing is, is you can identify that and you can now start to shift that paradigm away from more effort to more Jesus. Because listen to me really closely. Do you realize there's nothing that you can ever do to make God love you more or love you less? Do you realize that? Like in relationships, we have to put effort in in order to continue to grow them and nurture them. And if, if I do something for my wife, it may make her happy with me that day. If I don't do something, it may make her unhappy and vice versa. This is not how this works with God. There is nothing you can do to ever, ever make him like you less. And there's nothing you can do to ever, ever make him like you more. This should be so freeing in the freedom of what he has given us in salvation that that alone keeps us tethered to the centerpiece of the gospel where I'm not using more effort. I'm just surrendering to more Jesus. See, here's how I know how horrible this is because I lived my life like this for a long time. More effort, more things, more Bible studies, more people that I'm telling about Jesus, more, 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 more. And all the while, if I could have seen the glimpse of me from heaven, God would have been like, I mean, yeah, you're doing all this stuff, but I don't love you anymore for it. Hey, remember that whole entire year you didn't read your Bible? I don't love you less because of that. And we get stuck in this trap and we believe the enemy's lies and we make that the gospel of our lives. What we're going to do right now is I'm going to read through a section of scripture out of Ephesians and then we're going to play a song that I want you to sit and I want you to listen to the words. It's called Make Room. And what it is, is it's making room for Jesus to do what he wants to do in our lives. And a lot of times we just don't have room for Jesus. So Ephesians 1, starting in verse 18, you can read along on the screens. Here's what it says. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That's the calling on your life. What is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of a strength? So we're going to come back and talk about those. He exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Far above every ruler, authority, power and dominion and every title given not only in this age but also in the one to come and he's making a distinction that he is over all and everyone so why would we put more effort to get his approval and attention and verse 23 says which is his body the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way so here's what i want you to do if you can and you're comfortable, close your eyes and listen to the words of the song. Just let them process through the things that you've just heard today. If you can't, and this is weird for you, look, I get it. Just hang out with us for a few minutes. We'll be back. Everywhere we look, every, everybody has an opinion on what you should do. Look, if you're a follower of Jesus in this world and you're not listening to him, can I just tell you that you have to be going in a wrong direction? I want you to understand that. If he is not the top focal voice of your life, you're going in a wrong direction. Because nobody else is going to feed like he does. Nobody else is going to direct like he does. And the reason why we are so plagued by more effort is because we listen to everybody else that tells us what we need to be doing, not surrendering to Jesus and just listening to him say, make room for me. I want to do something in your life. This is actually Paul's prayer in verse 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the wealth of his glorious inheritance 
of the saints. This is the paradigm shift. That the eyes of your heart would be opened to know the hope of his calling for your life. Do you realize each and every one of you are made specifically to do something for him? Your gifts are not mine, mine are not yours, and thank God because we need all of us. But listen, if you're unfulfilled in your life, if you're frustrated with your life as a follower of Jesus, if you feel like you're constantly playing catch up, you're never ever satisfied with where you are, you feel like God's mad at you all the time, that you've let him down. Listen, you've not grasped this yet. It's because your life is being dictated by effort, not surrender. And you want to know why? We allow so much noise that for us to just stop and listen is so bizarre to us today. I don't even know that many of us could distinguish the voice of God right now because we've allowed so many voices in. We're buying into, hey, this guy, this girl said this is true. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. Wait, this one just proved it wrong. I'm going to do this. Wait, this seems to work for this person. I'm going to do this. Wait, wait, wait. And there's new information being downloaded all the time. And the one constant that remains steadfast in our lives is the voice of Jesus. That if we're tied to, because we're surrendering to more of him, not working off of effort, you will constantly, consistently, and continually hear his voice. You know what leaves after that? The frustration, the worry, the I wonder if God's happy with me. I wonder what I should do with my life. I wonder what direction I should go. He makes these things. He doesn't hide these things from us. We don't pursue them with him. Now, I I wanted you to make sure that you didn't hear me say that all your problems are going to go away and everything's going to be perfect. That's not what I said. What I said is your worry and your fear and your despondency and your apathy towards him is going to go away because you now are surrendering that to him. See, this is his prayer that the eyes of your heart would be opened up. This is the paradigm shift because in verse 19, this is, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the mighty work of his strength? Well, verse 20 answers that. It was raising Jesus from the dead. I want you to imagine this. Everybody in this room has probably been to a funeral. You understand you're paying your last and final respect to that person here on this earth. And there's not a chance that you will ever see them again here on this earth. We all understand that. What I think we forget so crucially to us surrendering to Jesus around the sake of the gospel over and over again is that the power that brought him back to life lives inside of you after salvation. You want to know how I know we forget that? Because we don't live different lives. There is nothing that can shake a person to the core as long as they get that. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of me. You can't shake me. It literally brought Jesus back from death to life. Yeah, this is a horrible thing I'm dealing with. You can't shake my faith, though. I know who I belong to. I don't have to try harder to believe this. I don't believe your lie, enemy. I know where I belong. And then this frustration and this anger and this worry and all of these things start to melt away because we realize this gospel is the centerpiece of moving from more effort to more Jesus. This was Paul's prayer for you. This is Jesus' prayer in John 17 that we would unify around this one thing as believers. And the enemy works constantly, continually, and at maximum effort to derail you from this all the time. So I started watching a new show called The Selection, and it reminded me a lot of our Christian life, because The Selection, it's near and dear to my heart, because my goal for my life was I actually enlisted in the Marine Corps. I wanted to be a lifer, Uh, I was going to go be Marine Force Recon, then I was going to go try out for the SEALs. I was convinced I could do it. I knew that was going to be the plan for my life. I get there. I literally get down to swear in. Doctor doesn't let me in because I have asthma, although they were letting lots of other people in. God said, no, this is not what you're going to do with your life. So I've stayed connected to that lifestyle, and, and I love studying that. And this new series that came out called The Selection takes six former 
um, special operators, a couple SEALs, Green Berets, and Rangers, and they take 30 average people who want to come and be tested to their limits for 30 days. And the very first opening scenes in this, they're telling a little bit about it, within the first 20 minutes of the first exercise, these guys know exactly who is going to drop out. They're all standing and they're walking around. They go, he's not going to make it. She won't make it past this. That guy's not going to make it to lunch. And they're right every single time because they can see something in people that will make this all the way till the end. And your enemy can see the exact same thing in you. He's had a few thousand years experience doing this. And as you're a brand new follower of Jesus and your paradigm is shifting away from more effort to more Jesus, because what's been ingrained in you your whole entire life is more effort. And he says, now it's more surrender. Your enemy can look and go, "Uh, you know what? They understand. She understands that that power that raised Jesus from the dead is actively working inside of her. She's not ever going to quit. She's going until the end. She's strong. She's powerful. We're going to trip her up. And we may make her question, but she's strong. She's coming back. That guy, he understands the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the hope of his life. It's central to the gospel and his understanding. We're not going to get him. He's going to the end. But, oh, look at these two. <laughs> oh, man, these guys will be easy. Like, they get it in salvation. They understood that power that, you know, they had to surrender to that would that raise Jesus from the dead. And, it, man, they're really excited now, but watch this. This won't even be hard. And the enemy knows, and the enemy can see, and the enemy can identify, and I hope that makes you furious. It made me mad just watching the show going, that's arrogant of you to think that guy's not even going to make it through this. Why wouldn't she make it? And they drop, and I'm like, dang, they were right. That's horrible. Those people are terrible. (laughs) It makes me mad that the enemy can see that about us, and I don't want him to see that about me. I don't want him to see that about you. But if you live your life based around effort, it's not even hard to trip you up. It's not even an effort for him. But if you live your life surrendered to more Jesus, he will never, ever be able to get you off that path of more surrender. If you understand the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of you, church. Now, I would imagine... Today has swirled a bunch of emotions for you as a follower of Jesus, and I'm glad for that. But I don't want to overwhelm you today either. What's the one central thing that keeps running around in your mind right now? Like, what is it for you? Is it that you think there does need to be something else besides Jesus for your salvation? Like, there's some workings here that that are markers for you? Is it that for you? Or is it that you really don't believe all of your sin was forgiven? Is that what it is for you? Maybe you are completely giving into a spirit of fear. Is it that you don't believe God didn't give you that spirit? Is it control of your life? Can you actually trust God with it? Is that what it is for you? Is it that you really honestly don't believe God knows what's better for you? You know what's better for you? Is that your struggle? What about the making disciple things? Like, I'm sure you have lots of excuses on why you don't do that, why you don't share the gospel with people. It's embarrassing, rejection, blah, blah, blah. I get all that. But is that an issue for you? Like, which one, which one's rising to the top for you? I want you to just focus on that one. What are you going to do with that today? As a follower of Jesus, look, I don't want you to leave here carrying any baggage you don't need to carry. And if your life has been dictated by effort, you're carrying lots and lots of baggage and frustration. Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus says, hey, you can put it all down. I'll take it. I don't want you to carry it anyways. So just put it down. So in your mind, I mentally want you to put that stuff down, literally set it down. Stop carrying it. But now there's work to do. There's effort in surrender. I want you to hear that. It's not like this. All right, fine. I give up. No, 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 no. Remember, it's, we're, we're walking out here away from him. We have to turn around. This requires effort, and we have to come back towards him. There is effort in surrender, too, but you're surrendering all of the things that you thought would get his attention to actually just come back into his intimacy. From more effort to more Jesus requires your surrender. What is the one thing, if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, you're going to surrender today? 
if you're not a follower of Jesus, what's the one thing that has kept swirling for you? This is why, maybe you're saying, this is why I'm not going to surrender my life. This is why I haven't surrendered to Jesus yet. Can we just talk through that with you? Because I was there too. I, I'm, a, I'm a question asker, man. Like, whenever I surrendered my life to Jesus, I had a million questions. Because I, I truly, genuinely wanted to know, and I wanted to know what I was surrendering to. I hope you're that way too. Because I would love to have these conversations with you and answer these questions the best we can. But I'm going to challenge you too, if you're not a follower of Jesus. What are you going to do with this today? Because now that you know there is hope, and you know there is something you can surrender to, I don't want you to leave here without at least having a conversation about it. So these couches right over here is where we pray for people and we have those conversations. I know it's going to require you to get up and go over there. I get all of that, but I promise you it's worth the journey over, okay? There'll be a couple of people over there standing there here in just a few minutes. I just want you to close your eyes with me. <clears throat> and, and I just want you to listen to the words of Scripture. Understand and grasp that the same power that raised you from Jesus from the dead is inside of you right now. And I want you to get a confident boldness where you tell the enemy he needs to back off, man. You're sick of his junk. Sick of the way that he can so easily trip you up. But then I want you to confess that at the same time and go, but, but Jesus, it's my fault. I've been working off of effort. Please forgive me. But then when, when you claim this power that is inside of you and the Holy Spirit in the form of that, like, what can he do to you? Because you're going to surrender to this and you're going to pull it back to the central understanding of who you are as a follower of Jesus. I want you to be able to own that today, to be able to walk out in that humble confidence that, man, I can just move back towards Jesus. The enemy cannot keep me here. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, I, I want you to hear me very carefully. You cannot leave this place without doing something about this if you've identified. We don't have time to waste. The world is slipping deeper and deeper into confusion and chaos by the minute. God is calling us as followers of Jesus to rise up, be hope dealers to rise up in the places that we live, that we work, that we play and take a different message of unity and hope to people. You don't have the option to just leave here. Please hear me. God, I pray for everybody in this room. The ones who are not yet following you, Jesus, I pray that they would be intrigued enough to have a conversation with us today. We're not going to try to talk him into anything. We literally just want to talk through things with him. I pray, God, that for the followers of you in here who've identified this in their life, God, please, Holy Spirit, I pray that you're burdening their hearts so bad they cannot leave this building without doing business with you and making things right. God, we love you. We pray that you'll be with this reflection time in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have questions, meet me on the couch.